Today on Straight Talk Africa, a discussion on land and poverty in Africa. Meanwhile, the World Bank 17th Annual Conference on Land and Poverty this week highlights the theme of scaling up responsible land governance. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, March 16th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the significance of this year's World Bank's conference on land and poverty. And coming up later in our social media segment, we'll share your thoughts on today's topic. That's through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. The World Bank Conference on Land and Poverty this week is putting special emphasis on women and property rights, particularly land rights. Delegates at the conference argue that gender equality is key to achieving sustainable development goals. My colleague, Esther Gizu Ewart, has more. The mere mention of land in Africa conjures different reactions ranging from excitement to accusations of injustice. Land rights across the continent is a contentious uh, issue. Few own vast pieces of land. Meanwhile, a majority of the population own strips of land or none at all. During a question and answer session on poverty and land issues last year, the World Bank engaged global faith groups to share their views. Ruth Messenger is president of the American Jewish World Service. It's a serious problem in agriculture, and I would say to all of us that protecting individual and smaller farmers' right to land is not only essential to moving people out of poverty, but it's a better weapon against climate change than large land grabs for, um, for exploitative use. In many countries, politicians own thousands of acres of land, some acquired legally and others through illegal means. The words land grabbing resonate across the continent, where the rich use tactical methods to steal land from the public. Mohammed Ashamawi is president of Islamic Relief Worldwide. Africa is not poor, but there are reasons for why poverty is happening. One of them is, for example, corruption. It is not the lack of resources, it is the way the resources are being distributed. The continent is rich with minerals, oil, and other natural resources. Yet most of the population live in abject poverty. Women who till the land have none to call their own. This is largely so due to cultural barriers that deny women ownership of property in patriarchal societies. Jim Young Kim, president of the World Bank Group. I think that the moral imperative to end poverty is something we can agree on. But what we also have to, to talk about is what's the best way to get there. You know, uh, we are for smallholder farmers, we're against land grabs. But there is evidence as to what is the best size of uh, agricultural operations to feed the most people. Let's, let's have an argument about that. Let's put the evidence on the table and let's discuss that. Let's talk about um, uh, how to build uh, a dams, for example, that provide clean energy for many years uh, while having the least possible impact on the people who live near the rivers. Many in Africa are still struggling to get access to clean water, energy, proper transportation of goods and services, or even maximize on agricultural productivity. We have to look at the issue of land tenure and land rights. We have to look at the power of resettling people, in, not in places where they are shunted aside, but in places where there are new sustainable development opportunities for them. Land and poverty remain a source of conflict among communities and families that can spill over beyond the borders of a country. Reformers hope that the current conference at the World Bank will help charter the way forward. As to get the Ewart, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Esther Gizui Ewart, for that report. Joining us here in our studios are two distinguished guests, Reverend Aniedi Okule, Executive Director, the Africa Faith and Justice Network Institute, and Dr. Saliyo Nyasi, 
a coordinator of Land Metrics Program at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Well, gentlemen, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. Thanks for, having, you us. for having us. We are grateful to be here. You're most welcome. Yeah. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The US country code is 1. Let me come to you, um, the Reverend, uh, immediately. Uh, you obviously have attended uh, some sessions uh, this week uh, at the World Bank. Your impression? Well, I think it's really a good thing to have this discussion at the World Bank level. Uh, first of all, I would say it's, you know, it, it's very impressive to see the number of organizations coming out to put this issue on the table. Uh, because in some ways, some of the companies that are involved in land grabbing themselves have turned to the World Bank for support uh, under the, uh, the context of development and food security, or even couching it in the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. So they get funded, but what actually happens in the long run is not something that uh, is well intended. And so having, having this level, at, uh, this discussion at this level, for me, is a wonderful thing. Uh, hopefully that we will engage further in terms of the policy that is driving land grabbing, mm -hmm. in terms of the funding process, and in terms of the consequences on local communities. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sally? You, to what extent are you impressed so far? Yeah, I'm very impressed by the number of talks uh, that were also given uh, at, the, at the conference. Um, uh, as you may be aware, land and the link between land and poverty, I think uh, it is not something that we need to demonstrate. And uh, it's good that also at the World uh, Bank level, people meet and discuss about this issue. And you see uh, the quality of presentation and the advance, uh, the use of technology that uh, has been uh, proposed by so many projects on how best we could uh, use these uh, new developments to, to better manage our resources and land. I think this has been something that was very impressive for me at the World Bank conference. Now, when you talk about uh, the link between uh uh, land and poverty. And we really talking uh, about agrarian societies here, really? Especially yes. Africa, Latin America, and Asia for that matter. Yes. Indeed, uh, the Global South, let's call them the Global South, these are developing countries. Uh, one of the, the issues, uh, uh, one of the reasons why they have poverty is because there is poor uh, management of their land. And of course, uh, the land is for them uh, the, the uh, resource. Uh, uh, that's uh, the agriculture they are, they are also practicing. Uh, that's also the forest where they're getting most of the, the resources. I think, yes, indeed, uh, I do agree. It's about uh, agrarian society in the global south, yes. So but, now, let me come to you again, uh, Reverend. Uh, you uh, also, you part of a group that organized the. Uh, another major international conference which was held uh, in Kenya mm -hmm. last year in November, in fact coincided with the visit of Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the two and contrast them, by the way? You know, really, actually, <laughs> 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 yeah, let's start with the conference in Nairobi, you know, that brought together uh, people from 113 organizations and 45 African countries and people from Europe, Latin America, and even here in the US. Uh, that conference was really focused on, first of all, the, the focus on the victims, the, the victims of land grabbing, because very often at the international high-level conference, we hear the narratives from the people who are engaging in, quote, development who are engaging in the land deals, and so the... Investment. Investment. So we hear investment, we hear development, we hear food security, we hear all of that. But when, when like in the Nairobi conference put together for, uh, by Africa Faith and Justice Network here, in conjunction with the conference of the bishops in, in Africa, we, we were bringing in people who are actually affected. We had 19 workshops, people from... Uh, different countries of the continent mm -hmm. coming to say, 
what you are saying is affecting us directly, and this is how we've lost our land, we've lost our, uh, our jobs, we've lost uh, our, our source of uh, educating our children, and not only that, we see that in some of these places, the people who take the land promising to plant one thing end up planting another. And so that, that conference in Nairobi was really focusing to hear the narratives of those directly affected by land grabbing. We had a case, for example, a, a British company, a UK company that took land in, in Tanzania, mm -hmm. promising food production, increased food production, uh, and then dislocated the people. So the people lost the land. They were promised compensation. None came. They were promised school for their children. None came. And the company turned around and planted Jatropha, which is supposed to uh, use for biofuel, bio 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 you know. Right, right. And, but, but in the, in the, the end, now we, they see that Jatropha is not all that it was cranked up to be. They have abandoned the project. So the people have lost their land. They have lost the source of livelihood. They no longer have the land to plant. And they are left with this acres, hundreds of thousands of acres of land with plants that they don't know what to do. So the, the huge difference between the Nairobi conference mm -hmm. is a difference between listening to the victims and in some ways in this case we are dealing with policy issues but also having most of the companies, organizations, multinationals involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are here in town, you know, participating and pushing their narratives. But thank God for organizations like Land Metrics and Go and ourselves trying to see, show the world the other side of uh, the, the, the equation, the, the other side of the coin. Are you suggesting, for example, that uh, at a, a major conference like we have in Washington this mm -hmm. week, mm -hmm. the small guy, the ordinary primary stakeholder in Africa, for example, mm -hmm. is in fact not represented? General, generally, they are missing at the table. They are. Somebody <laughs> is claiming or purporting to speak on their behalf? Yep, that's the point. Yes, in fact, that, is the, that has been what has been affecting this process from the, from the word go. That, the, you know, we are always speaking for them. And we don't hear their voices. We don't hear how they are affected, what this means for their livelihood, what this means for ancestral land, what this means even for their spiritual life. So, so that's who has been missing at the table. And because of that, the narrative mm. has been very much skewed in favor of the investors. Investors you know, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, Sally, you, someone might, of course, uh, uh, come up with an argument that uh, when you talk about investment, it is meant, for example, to address the issues of poverty and starvation. Doesn't he do it? Well, um, us uh, in Land Matrix, we, we indeed deal with uh, the, the investment, you know, uh, the foreign investment in Africa. Uh, uh, we, there are a number of studies that have shown that uh, it is expected that when a foreign investor comes and invests in a land, uh, there is some capacity building. He comes with technology. They provide that the jobs, for they example. They provide jobs. Yes. They come with knowledge that the farmer can benefit from. And, uh, and this is, is something to consider as positive. But in many cases, uh, the hunger remains, the poverty remains, and farmers are complaining. And most of all, these deals don't happen uh, in, a, in a transparent way. So at the end of the day, who actually is the beneficiary? Who benefits, really? Uh, when we talk about food security, for yeah. example, uh -huh. who in fact benefits here? Uh, I'm not sure that I can actually say that uh, Africans do, I mean, the poor farmer or the smallholder farmer do benefit from this. Uh, it, it does bring some, some, some uh, let's say, some income, mm -hmm. but it's not enough you because know? people are still complaining on the ground. I see. Well... Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka, that's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA World Bank Conference. 
and we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa, become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on oh, Twitter. The... Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. This is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you again. Uh, yeah. one of, perhaps one of the most controversial um, class cases in as far as r land reform is concerned happened in the Republic of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Probably as far back as uh, the year 2000 or around that time. Um, this is a place, obviously, where you had advanced commercial farming and it seemed to most people, at least, who were able to monitor what was going on, that uh, the country was stable. People were fed, they had employment, everything seemed to be working. But once that land was removed from some or majority of the commercial farmers and handed over to the indigenous Zimbabwean farmer, the picture completely changed. How do you explain that? You know, there is uh, underlining uh, uh, connotations to that, uh, what you just described. Yes, it's true, and uh, factually that happened in terms of uh, food production dropped, uh, chaos setting. But when you look at where the, the reason behind it, when you have uh, a few people who were not originally from that land, come in and are having the prime land, vast amount of acre, hectares of land, even some of them owning as big as one county here. More than, in fact, uh, three quarters of the prime land, the prime yes. territory in yes. that country, belong to that class of people, about 4,500 commercial farmers. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so the question now is, the question you're asking, which is, oh, how come that there was food available and then now when things are changed it's no longer available first of all there, there's the issue of let's go back to the issue of justice in this case the, there was food but the, the population, the majority of the people were working like slaves for the big farm, farmers you mean like under Jim Crow yeah, exactly. in the southern parts of absolutely. the United States absolutely, mm -hmm. there were slaves yeah, food production but at what cost and as whose expense, whose blood. So do we continue to keep that going just because there is food production? Absolutely mm. not. In fact, that is something we need to warn ourselves of what is going on. Because right now, when you have the same process, you know, multinationals galloping uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres of land mm -hmm. from the people, and they are quarantined, if you would, into tiny, tiny portions. You are setting up a place, uh, you are setting up something for conflict in the future. So uh, the Zimbabwe case is some, a lesson that African leaders should learn from because uh, south of Zimbabwe is also South Africa. <laughs> south of Limpopo. Yeah, the yeah. River Limpopo. <laughs> it's That's also where south the elephant Africa. is. Yes, yeah, so, so when you see that same thing that Fewer people are living in luxury, and then you have Sweto townships and all of that. People being pushed into the, the non fertile lands right. and crowded into shanty towns. Right. And then we said, oh, we are, things are stable. No, things are not stable. <laughs> they are deceptive because underlying that are people who are suffering, there are people who are disenfranchised, there are people who have been dislocated from their land, 
and the, the, you know, a generation of poverty, cycle of poverty that they can never extricate themselves from. I have heard some people say, oh, let's look at Zimbabwe and, and return the land to the former master so things can be right. That's not how to do it. I, I think what uh, would have been better that it would have been planned systematically by the, by the gov uh, governance of the country to ensure that when this land is given to others, they provide them the means of uh, generating food mm. and, on, and making stable production. Mm. So returning to the old way is no longer acceptable. You so do, you, do you agree with uh, the Reverend that uh, perhaps Mugabe, in fact, may have made uh, the right decision, except that uh, perhaps the manner in which it was carried out? Well, uh, I don't want to, <laughs> to, to judge uh, the decision of uh, Robert Mugabe, Mugabe, but what I know is that uh, when land was taken from the previous owners and given to the indigenous people, what did the government do in terms of accompanying those people to produce uh, quality uh, food uh, to ensure food security? And also, uh, I'm sure uh, there is, the, uh, I think it's all, it all comes with the issue of governance. Because mm. you take the land and give it to people. Not all people are necessarily interested in farming. Right. Or if they are interested in farming, not huge, huge amount of land. Therefore, there would be, of course, some breakdown when uh, those who used to produce the, 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 uh, the who used to to produce uh, food uh, from those land and the technology that they have, if it is not given uh, to, to to the indigenous people, they would definitely not, they are going to fail. So I think that is also a mistake. Like Prof. Uh, Reverend said, that we need to take less lessons from there. If we want to help our farmers or to encourage our farmers to take our land and produce it, we should give them the means at the same time, the technology and the resources as well, and the market. Yes. You talk about, of course, uh, how the issues of land reform or land grabbing and what have you obviously have a link uh, to the issues of good governance yes. or the absence of it. But what about somebody who might say, wait a minute, when President Robert Gabriel Mugabe mm -hmm. did his thing, at the time, Zimbabwe seems to have actually been one of the most democratic countries on the African continent. Are you suggesting that he was not able to consult here? Well, uh, maybe, uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, I think, uh, we, like I say, it's, it's an issue of uh, governance, poor, poor governance probably, you know. They, uh, maybe there they have been also other countries who did not also support his decision. There have been also, uh, let's say... For example? Uh, I don't want to give names, I don't have exact <laughs> details, but... but uh, I know Zambia, of course, uh, and uh, now late President uh, Mwanawasa, yes, uh, yeah. didn't seem to be on the same page with him. Mm -hmm. Nor did, in fact, uh, Ian Kama, Seretse Kama, the president mm -hmm. of Botswana, mm -hmm. didn't seem to be on the same page with him. Yeah, but all I'm trying to say is that uh, as far... Uh, as long as this issue is addressed in a fair way, in a just and equitable way, in a transparent way, so that everyone is consulted, both the farmers, the civil society, and the international partners, if all of them are consulted in how to redistribute these land resources, I think they, they, there may be less problem than there is now. Compensation and Compensation, yeah. And because there will always be frustration. But what about the fact that uh, the Prime Minister of England then, uh, Tony Blair, yeah. stopped, in fact, the compensation package mm -hmm that had been put in place mm -hmm. by uh, Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. the Iron Lady, mm -hmm. and John Major. Mm -hmm. He stopped the distribution of that mm -hmm. fund. Yeah. Something that, by the way, to a certain degree, at least seemed to have worked in Kenya, mm -hmm. where you spent a lot of years, even though there are still consequences mm -hmm. of that particular policy. Mm -hmm. so, well, so that brings in, you know, you are, I was highlighting another thing here, where where some, sometimes interventions in the process undermine a process that was working. Mm. So in this case, even, you know, the Mugabe case, as you mentioned, both of you talk about, you know, if, if the, we had looked around and said, okay, uh, Mr. President, what you are doing, it's, it's fair, but you have also to be just and accompany people, do compensation so that this thing can work, you know, for both uh, the indigenous people and mm -hmm. those who 
some of them through no fault of that, mm. inherited this huge acre of land that goes back 50, 60 or more years. Mm -hmm. So, but instead, some people see the immediate mm -hmm. consequences mm -hmm. without the long-term effect or how we got here. It's, for example, I mean, the, the thing that happened here that when you took using the abolition of slavery here, people said, oh, it's going to affect our economy. So let's keep where that, I mean, that is documented. Mm -hmm. so, so, <laughs> so for the sake of peace, let's keep this land in the few, a few hands so we can continue to have food at any cost. That's, that's not acceptable. That's not justice. But when, you know, again, when it comes to Zimbabwe, uh, during the uh, independence talks mm -hmm. of 1979 at Lancaster House, uh, there was something major that was agreed upon. This was the issue of willing seller, willing buyer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would it, Mr. Mugabe have gone about that? Yeah, okay, the willing seller, willing buyer. You know, again, that, uh, that's a whole Pandora's box, you know. Who was willingly selling those lands in the first place? No, they weren't willingly selling it. You know, <laughs> like what is happening today? Most of the underlying, most of the land acquired in Africa today are not willingly sold. People don't even, I mean, there's the case in South Sudan uh, where a company in Dallas, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, went and acquired, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land. The people woke up one day trying to graze their goods. And I chased out and said, this is my land. Mm -hmm. I said, no, my father is buried here. My uncle is buried there, so I own it now. So if, say, 50 years from now, the person said, oh, it was willingly sold to me. No, it wasn't. And uh, sorry, let me chip in something here. We have a case that we followed, Africa Faith and Justice Network followed in Volta region in Ghana. Uh -huh. Heracles Farm from uh, New York went and acquired land by 3,750 hectares from the people promising them all kinds of things. But then they turned around, what did they do? To, just to plant palm, palm oil for fuel. They have deprived the person from the land and all food is deprived. Right. But what is intriguing is that they hurriedly signed an agreement where the local chief didn't even read. We, we obtain it, and you know what the clause is that uh, they put in that clause mm. uh, in the agreement, this Heracles farm, that if there is any dispute in this agreement later, it will have to be settled in a court in Paris, Very France. Interesting. You know? So, so how, do you, how do you say that people were willingly agreeing to that? Uh, they didn't even know what it is. The local mm. chiefs didn't know, except a few corrupt two corrupt Ghanaians who were working with, uh, <laughs> you know, with uh, Heracles Farm to who, who affront this. We are personally benefiting the from Personally the benefiting from it. And so even when the thing flopped, Heracles Farm turned around and sold that land to a British company, Volta Red. You know? Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I so, thought that is something that could have happened in 1884-85 in yeah. Berlin uh -huh. when Africa was being partitioned <laughs> yeah. Yeah. without the presence of a single African on that huge yes. table. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Well, you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariama Jero. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now here is our letter of the week from a follower in Juba who responded to our question of the week. Kambozi Ismail Musa from Juba in South Sudan writes, what matters most, not to me, but for all, is how and when, basically, should the World Bank print more currencies of various denominations to control poverty spirals and unresourceful use of land, though man-made challenges nature. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC. 
right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidi Ewart, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. As we've mentioned, uh, the World Bank's uh, 17th Annual Conference on Land and Poverty uh, taking place this week in Washington, D.C., highlights the theme of scaling up responsible land governance. And as we speak, uh, participants are discussing what can be done to guarantee uh, inclusiveness, sustainability, and capacity building, which leads us to our question of the week, asking, what uh, matters to you at the World Bank uh, Conference uh, on Land and uh, Poverty? Well, before we begin, I'd like to thank you for using all our social media platform uh, to communicate to us. And another reminder that we are indeed tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA World Bank Conference. If you haven't yet, do follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Speaking of it, uh, let's go to a tweet from Emmanuel Cacelli, who tweeted, I support a poverty er eradication, all the same with Europe and America taking our riches by injudicious means. Well, that was Emmanuel Kachele. Uh, uh, we'll go to another tweet uh, from uh, Jay Gason Mansour in Uganda, who writes, there is a need to give equal rights to all when it comes to ownership of land, which women in Africa traditionally don't. Well, let's now turn uh, to uh, our Facebook fans and uh, go to Adam uh, Suwale uh, from Tamale in Ghana who writes, how is the World Bank and the IMF in particular able to reconcile the purpose of this conference and the popular accusations about their role in the impoverishment of African countries? And that through their paternalistic policies. Hmm. It is a very interesting question, uh, I would say, your take, guys. Very interesting. Uh, it's all yours, uh, Salim. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> uh, I like uh, some of those uh, comments, uh, but uh, all I can say as far as land matrix is concerned, we uh, monitor the land investment all over the, the global south, uh, particularly in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, when we look at the number of deals in Africa, we have around 480 deals in Africa, which cover an area of uh, 24 million hectares. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the main target areas are South Sudan, uh, Sudan DRC, Mozambique, Ethiopia, and Ghana, and the uh, main investor come from UK, what about US, Kenya? USA. Yeah, Kenya is also ta a targeted country. Tanzania? As well Tanzania. as Thailand. Uganda? I mean, of course. All those, <laughs> all those, I'm just giving you the top Liberia. most targeted countries. What about your motherland, uh, Senegal? Indeed, we have some few issues there in Senegal, having uh, countries like uh, uh, deals with uh, yeah, issues with Italy, uh, Italian investors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all over the country. I mean, it's, Africa is the most targeted continent. Uh, there's no doubt about it, and it's known. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to, well, it's again, uh, it's all for you again, uh, Mariamo. Yes, uh, we'll go to a comment from uh, Kazarwa Seth uh, in Kampala, Uganda, who writes, that African countries are poor because of selfish interest in African leaders. They want to overstay in power, uh, which has left Africa without uh, much change and created uh, corruption in African countries. Most of the time, election leaders uh, invest a lot in bribing people to vote in their favor, hence misusing government funds. Another Facebook comment comes uh, from Nolan uh, Kabwe in uh, Zambia, and he writes that some of these issues need to be discussed today because uh, many Africans are suffering 
due to high poverty level and for land, Africans need to settle property with their families. Shaka, again, and guest, uh, your take on these comments. Well, your reaction, uh, Reverend Okule. Yes, you know, the issue of bad governance that keeps coming up is absolutely true. You know, Africa has vast amount of resources, fertile land, uh, minerals, name it, a very fav favorable weather, no major earthquakes. So it's one of the most stable continent on earth, and in fact, one of the richest. But people are living in poverty conditions unimaginable because, one, the selfishness that based the past commentator on it, <laughs> the selfishness of a few people, the corruption, and the, the, the short-sightedness of some of the leaders who are readily mortgaging their whole future and the future of generations to come for immediate gains, for a bowl of soup, if you would, uh, for caviar, whatever they, they are gaining from it. So that needs to be addressed. But Another of the commentators talking about that Africa are looking at the World Bank at IMF with suspect because of history. If you look at some of the structural adjustment programs across the continent from Nigeria to, you know, through to the, the far east of the continent, structural adjustment program recommended by IMF have ended up impoverishing most of those continents and mm -hmm. most of those countries. So there is a, a suspicion uh, out there on the continent about the activities, the role IMF and World Bank is playing in continuing to impoverish it. The, Brit the Britain Woods institutions? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the institutions that have links to former colonial masters. So, so there, is, there is a suspicion there. So, it is actually a, a good time for IMF and the World Bank to redeem its image, if they want to stay clear of it, to redeem it, its image by consulting the people, by finding out what kind of investment do people want, not what the investor wants. What kind of food are people are wanting? Because most of this land grab, they plant food that end up being exported to the investors' countries. So the people on the land get doubly deprived. You know, so that's the problem there. Very interesting. Well, thanks, Mariema, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, it's interesting that uh, the Reverend mentioned the structural uh, adjustment policies. Uh, I definitely grew up uh, during that time, and I remember them. I can't forget about those structural adjustment policies. But I also have a lot of friends who work at the World Bank, a lot of Africans, and every time I bring, in, uh, bring up the structural adjustment policies, their response is that it's a new World Bank, it's a new IMF, so I do want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And as you said, maybe they, the World Bank uh, and IMF um, need to do some work um, to try to maybe change that uh, kind of idea that some of us old folks <laughs> have uh, about those institutions. Well, that will do it uh, for today's uh, social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please, please keep them uh, coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Just go to the VOA Straight Talk Africa program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next time on Straight Talk Africa, we'll discuss the Benin presidential election. Join host Shaka Sally, his panel of guests, and me, Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter, as we talk about Benin's politics. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back, and today, of course, we are talking about the significance of this year's World Bank's conference on land and poverty. 
or distinguished guests, uh, Reverend Niedi Okule, Executive Director of the Africa Faith and Justice Network Institute, and Dr. Saliyu Nyasi, a coordinator of Land Metrics Program at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Again, uh, gentlemen, I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. I'm Thank grateful you. to be here. Thanks like for having to be me. Here. You're most welcome. What do you think about uh, the reaction from uh, the people through social media? Saliyu? I think uh, the reaction of people uh, expresses, again, um, it, it, it also demonstrates the level of insatisfaction and uh, the level of despair that the people, the African people are. Mm. I think uh, us in Landmatrix, we believe in uh, creating a database to improve transparency and promote debate uh, in, in, at national level, at regional and global level mm -hmm. by providing uh, uh, accurate data. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that when the data is uh, available and public, when these transactions and land deals, investments are being contracted in a transparent way, then people have a chance to actually uh, point their finger or raise their hand to say whether they agree or not, or whether they should renegotiate the deal so that it is equitable and mm. it is fair. Mm. So that is, I think, what is lacking. And for us, uh, as, as, as far as land is concerned, uh, the, the issue of governance is, is very recurrent. And uh, one of the ways to tackle it is actually to provide data and information. And now, when, you, do. when you talk about uh, uh, providing or, or creating an environment whereby uh, you can provoke a debate, mm -hmm. uh, do you also factor in uh, the possibility, for example, of what uh, uh, Reverend Okule characterized as the victim? Do you factor in the victim to participate in that type of debate, or are we just looking at uh, policymakers, uh, academicians, uh, uh, investors, uh, uh, international civil servants work for the World Bank, IMF, and what have you? Indeed, uh, the Land Matrix is an initiative that is uh, led by institutions uh, such as uh, Farmers Association. We do have Farmers Association, we have the International Land Coalition, we do have uh, uh, people at grassroots level where the information that we actually generate does, does, does channel. When you talk about Farmers Association, uh, frankly, I get the sense that you are talking about uh, commercial farmers perhaps. Uh, or maybe at small, small scale, you know, farmers. But are you also factoring in really someone that uh, is, uh, for example, uh, referred to as uh, a peasant farmer, an ordinary peasant farmer? Indeed, because the information that we produce, we generate, is public. It is public. Anybody, anyone can use it. Uh, you must the, be illiterate, of course. He must be literate, but yes. most... But the Af vast majority of African peasant farmers, the last time I checked, frankly, <laughs> probably are not on that page. <laughs> Actually, what happened is we made, we use a lot of infographics. We make the information very accessible. At the first glance, somebody can, can, is able to say, this is happening here. Mm. And we use also... Geo, uh, geolocation data whereby the person can actually go to that particular place to confirm whether mm. this is taking place or not. Interesting. So it is a growing initiative. Uh, we just have uh, four years. We are celebrating our four years anniversary. Yeah. Uh, we hope that uh, what we are doing is relevant because there are some policy guidelines. We have the FNGs. We have the VGG the voluntary guidelines. These are voluntary. Countries can decide whether they adopt or not. But we believe that if we create these national observatories, which are owned by countries, mm. countries can actually, civil society, there are many activists when it comes to land issues. There are so many activists uh, who are uh, fighting for women's rights, who are fighting for uh, justice, and these people can actually take this information from our database, which is actually the prime source of reliable information on land investment in, in, in the global south to actually take it forward and make sure that our policy, whenever they're making decisions, they refer to our information. Well, unfortunately, in Studio 52, there is no democracy. When a producer says you have to go, you have to go, but we'll be back. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. If you wish to participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please, don't go away.
we are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective. Things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique. And this gives me that, uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237 USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizhi. You words, of course, and uh, this is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you again, uh, Reverend Okude. You obviously heard uh, your colleague, uh, Sali Yu, talking very, very intelligently here, remarkably, in fact, uh, uh, articulate. But let's go to Ethiopia. As I did my research, I ran into the issue of the land rush. Mm -hmm. I looked at these ordinary farmers, for example, uh, in Gambera region, mm -hmm. in Oromio. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, this Indian company called Karaturi mm -hmm. Agro. Absolutely. Wait a minute. This can't be for these ordinary folks no. in Oromio no. or Gambera. In fact, the people have been displaced. Yes. The people you are talking about are now homeless. And the minister is claiming, for example, when interviewed by a journalist, that yes. this was actually done voluntarily. No. That's, that's the lie that has been affronting. That's the point of saying that the victims' voices have not been heard in, in most of this is what is going on. You know, uh, yes, the, the, those people in Ethiopia have been literally quarantined. What they were promised... Or, I mean, some of them just woke up one day and then they were told, your land belonged to somebody else. Exactly. You know? I, I guess that uh, we have to bring in some callers from the continent. Yeah. Good evening, Samuel, from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Samuel, can you hear me? Good evening, Lugusakasari. How are you? I am hugely terrific. How are you today? I'm very nice and uh, I welcome you back to studio and uh, thank you for your professionalism which you showed when you are here in Uganda. Thank you very much. Uh, it was of course uh, an honor and a privilege uh, to be asked by uh, of course uh, Ugandans to be part of that uh, historical uh, event which was of course moderating the presidential debate. The pleasure is mine and much obliged. Now uh, I go to Reverend Okure when the land policy in Zimbabwe went in favor of the indigenous Zimbabwean farmers, it was mishandled, and the compensation parameters uh, no, uh, were not in favor of uh, the, the Zimbabwean. The, the Great Britain government did not compensate them, and that one became problematic to the uh, uh, President Mugabe. What is your take? If the audience suggests that, wait a minute, the indigenous African farmers need to be trained in using automobile machines and farming methods and urban farming to increase on their production. Thank you, Shaka, and thank you, the audience and uh, the panelists. You're most welcome. Yeah. Go for it. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with the suggestion. It should have been a smooth transition. The government should have st stood behind the people and those who were willing to be farmers to su uh, supply them with the technology, to supply them with the resources, because the food w uh, would have been produced for the country. But we see the role of uh, the Britain in this case undermined the effort. So uh, th there is a, a larger narrative that we all have to look at here, that sometimes the efforts of others undermine what is going on locally. 
And uh, we, look, we look back, we have to learn from the lessons of history, lessons of colonialism, lessons of people saying, oh, we are coming to help civilize Africa. We are coming to help them you know, develop their culture. To save you from yourself, right? To save you from yourself. <laughs> and look at where Africa is, OK? And then we have others now coming on. We are coming to help Africa develop food, food security. And look at what is happening. What is really mind-boggling for me is that some African leaders have not learned the lessons of history. You know, something that is staring us in the face. This has happened before. It's happening again, even though called with another name. And they can't see the link between what happened before and what is happening now. And you refer to them as leaders? Are, they, are those, in fact, leaders? Or are they perhaps leaders. rulers? Rulers, even rulers, you know, they're, they're a good ruler. I don't know what to call them. <laughs> Kleptocrats. <laughs> Maybe that would be it. <laughs> Very interesting. Let's go to the other side of the continent, and that is Patrick. Patrick from Nigeria. Good evening, Patrick. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Saka. I am hugely terrific, my brother. Welcome back. Profoundly Thank honored and exceedingly God. humbled for your compliments and support, Patrick. We thank God, Mr. Saka. Welcome back. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure to have you on this program. Uh, Patrick will clap for you now to be in Nigeria. I want to find out from our guest. In Africa today, the government will say the land belongs to the, even the land that belongs to individuals. At the end of the day, the surplus land, no cultivation, and we talk about food security. The land is there, and people continue suffering. And when we talk about all this no, 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 we get from other the conditionalities are not very, very comfortable to African continent. Why is it that Africa is depending on those issues? And today, mechanization of agri in Africa is very, very scant. Why is this? Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, going to the reverend. Yes, good question. What uh, about uh, Sariu? He referred to me. Really? Well, yeah. okay. well, I leave it to him. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> no, we are not against investment. Let's get it clear. We are not against a uh, developing agricultural sector. Let's get that clear. What, uh, what needs to be done here is that you, know, you, you consult the people, you engage in, in a fair process, you involve the people not just as stakeholders but as shareholders in the process. We find out if, if I'm coming to help you, I need to ask you what would you like me to help you with before I even give you my ideas. But in this case, they systematically coming in, deciding what you need, how you are going to need it, and when you are going to need it. In addition, if you look at what is produced, like in the question of, uh, you mentioned vast amount of in land Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, for example. What is produced is being exported. The people are not benefiting from it. But surely there must be some elements in Ethiopia who are benefiting hugely. Here. Absolutely. A, few, a handful of people, not just in Ethiopia, in Liberia, in Zimbabwe. You know, in all these in countries all we are these talking countries about. we are talking about, a handful of people are benefiting from it. Let Is it like 10% or something? Ah, it's, it's very few. <laughs> if, if it's 5%, is 5% too many. There are a handful of people. For example, talk of uh, indigenous people collaborating. We just found out one of uh, my, my colleague, uh, Bahati, from Africa Faith and Justice Network. From DRC. Yeah, ju yes, just came back from Ghana. And then found out that in, in one of the land deals, a Ghanaian, you know, a Ghanaian was fronting with it. And then uh, grabbing this land, 30, you know, 14,000 acres of land, yes. you know, for this company at yes. 38,000 cities for 20 years. That is oh. at $1.40 an acre for 20 years. Yes. So, so there are people locally who are benefiting from it and then leaving the rest impoverished for generations to come. You know, I was looking at uh, comments, for example, by uh, uh, a Karatuli executive mm -hmm. who asked the question, uh, you know, uh, who said, in fact, I don't think that creating wealth is a crime. This is a man who is saying that, uh, especially in, in, in view of the fact that his group is the world's largest producer of roses, 
flowers. Exactly. Truly, Ethiopians, people in Romia and Gambia do not, Eat frankly, roses. interact with roses, really. No. No, I mean, even Kenya next door, you know, exactly. is one yeah. of the largest the producer of cut flowers. You know, flowers for, for England. Yeah. People don't eat it. They're looking for maize. Yes. What's we call yes, corn? There is what issue of, yeah. so, yeah. so what is happening is that we are taking people's land and planting flowers, planting jatropha and exporting. And you call that investment? No. That's Which, by investment. the way, exploit the land so much because they probably need a lot of water, actually. Exactly. Yeah. You, met, you mentioned something else. If you look at where the investors have their land, yes. there is water nearby. Yes. And very often, they take the, the local source of water to irrigate the land. And so the people are deep, doubly deprived of land and deprived of their sources of water. None of these investors goes to an arid land to improve it. They go for where the land is already prime and fertile. That's what we found out throughout. This is crazy this because, is also uh, frankly, with the land matrix data. Yes. Yeah, it, it reminds me, of course, uh, of uh, what happened to Nigeria when it hit oil. Exactly. Nigeria used to be self-sufficient in terms of food. food production and exporting food and exporting even food. Yes. But when it hit the the black gold, Everything what happened? Went. Yeah. You even have a man like Ken Sarawiwa yes. actually being hanged by dictator General Sunny Abacha yep. because he is pleading for his people. Yes. Sincerely, I can't so, so when people say that, oh, Africa can produce food, that is not true. As a child, you know, in, in growing up in Nigeria, Nigeria produced more food than it needed and exported it. So that technology is there. People can produce food. If the government rechannels the energy of each of every country to food production, we don't need uh, people to come and take 600, uh, uh, two counties to, for one person to produce food. That's Sa not, uh, Sadi, you, you have the last word. Yes, um, the reason why, despite all this investment, Africa is for, I think we have discussed it, uh, is, it comes from the selfishness of our leaders. Um, Selfishness of our leaders? Selfishness. What can we do in order to liberate them from that selfishness? Uh, Don't we have an obligation, really? We do have an obligation. It's the people. Yes. The voice of the people should come out. People should be give, respected and given also the means. But how do those leaders, self. in fact, come into those positions? Are they, in fact, legitimately elected in those positions? Or do they do a bit of creative accounting? <laughs> well... And then uh, your for their foreign masters. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, elections in Africa, you know, is always a farce. It's always, uh, it's always a joke. Not you always. Know. I don't think the elections in South Africa are farce. So the last Nigeria, election in Nigeria was and, a farce. And in, in Tanzania. Mm. Well, in Tanzania, the maybe in Tanzania. Mainland, I don't it know. Depends on, it, de it depends on how. It depends on our. This depends on our perception of what democratic democracy means. Democracy maybe may mean something. The government of the people by the people for the, for the people. people. That the is the government of some people. That is the, univer some that is the universal <laughs> definition. But but the African definition of it, it varies from one country to another. Very interesting. So people say, how can I organize an election and lose? Unfortunately, <laughs> time happens not to be our best ally. On that note, thanks to our distinguished <laughs> guests, the Reverend Daniel Okule, the Chief Director of the Africa Faith and Justice Network Institute, and Dr. Sali Yunyasi, the Coordinator of Land Metrics Program at the Universal Pretoria in South Africa. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not bitter Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. Thank you.